Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Sunday. My name's Amanda. I'm the Events and Marketing Director for Bookworks, your longtime independent bookstore in Albuquerque. We're located in the Rio Grande River Valley in a shopping center that's all local. Thank you so much for supporting our local bookstore during the holidays. We are excited to be moving into our second season of virtual events. The first season, wow, what a learning curve. Uh, we did 77 events in 2020 during the COVID-19 pandemic, and we're starting off this year as well. We do miss the live world. We hope to see you all at some live events later on in the year. But until then, we have our calendar all situated through March and April. If you want to go to our website and check that out, see what we have coming up. The website is bookworks.com without the O's. So it's, well, actually it's bkwrks.com. So it has one O, o in the com, bookworks without the O's.com. I'll pop that into the chat as well as the link to Bill O'Neill's second novel, Short Session. We're here today with Bill. He is a longtime congressman here in New Mexico for District 13. <laughs> Now a senator getting started with the legislative session next week. He is also a pretty prolific author. He's got some books of poetry. He has The Freedom of the Ignored. The first book in this series, Panoramic Diaries, we launched uh, last year. So we got to hear about the protagonist, Chapman Murphy. We'll get to hear more about him today. Uh, Bill, Senator O'Neill, is going to read from his book for a while. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then we will take some questions from you all. And hopefully we can end with a little bit of a meet and greet at the end of the event. So if you have any questions, feel free to pop those in the chat to me. If you think of a question during the event, you're welcome to chat that. You can also raise your hand when we get to that point. I can mute and unmute folks. Very happy to see some other politicos on the call. Authors, Dee Dee Feldman, Fred Harris, hello. Happy to see some O'Neills. Happy to see all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Bill O'Neill, are you ready to tell us a little bit more about your second novel, new from Red Mountain Press, Short Session? I have a feeling this might have some, some sort of personal background that you, uh, you know about. All right, well, thank you. Thank you, Amanda, and I want to thank Bookworks for hosting this. You do such a great job, and yes, you are located in the best legislative district in the state, in the beautiful North Valley off Rio Grande. I want to thank my editor, my very patient um, and very demanding editor, Susan, um, with, Ruzen, with uh, Red Mountain Press. And um, anyway, basically, I want to thank everybody, family, friends, constituents, roommates from college, people in my own family of origin, um, you know, thanks for tuning in. I will say, you know, the game that you're missing soon isn't that interesting, the Saints and the Bears, like the real game will be, of course, later this evening with my Browns taking on the Steelers. But anyway, I'm glad we didn't conflict with that. Um, short session is titled that way because in New Mexico, we're a really odd state in that we're, we have to be the only state that has a short session, meaning 30 days. So we call it the short session. The, uh, the context of this book is basically it's, it's January 2005. And the narrator, the protagonist, Chapman Murphy, has just lost his election having run for the first time for the New Mexico State Senate in 2004. And he finds himself reflecting upon that very intense experience and, and he's up at the legislature, which he always does, short session or long session, advocating for his beloved halfway house residential program, Hope House, where it's really important this time to, to secure funding uh, because as many of your small charities know, um, it's always the wolf's at the door, like the money is really low and, and Chapman really needs to come through getting state funding through the corrections department for Hope House. So that's the context. So um, I also, I have to, to acknowledge uh, 
Joe Christmas. He's out there and he knows who he is and he is who I dedicate this book to. So, okay, here we go. Chapter one. I should clarify that I was not exactly invited to run for State Senate District 10. People like me who feel such an urge or calling, we don't really need to be prodded. We are alert to the opportunity when it presents itself. An incumbent retiring, a new district created courtesy of gerrymandering, a bad vote. There is always the justification deep down that we individually can do a better job than those folks that are there. That we belong in that role instead. In my case, I need to also admit that my reasons for declaring were less than pure. I wanted to play in the basketball game, the House Senate charity basketball game, I admit it. The, this annual event complete with uniforms, coaches, announcers, referees, cheerleaders, played in front of a nearly full high school gym, a band even, all proceeds, of course, to the local homeless shelter. I, I couldn't help it as I would watch these games from the bleachers, I just couldn't help but imagine that what I could do if given the opportunity to play in that game. You had to be a legislator though, in order to play. No staff, advocates, lobbyists, no former governors. Each chamber represented one of the two dueling state universities, which plugged into that rivalry as well. I had visions of how many baskets I could score, three pointers as well, but I needed to be elected first. And then there was the other reason, the red license plate, which represented the other reason why I wanted to run for office. I have no idea why possessing this honor of a license plate had such a pull for me. It just did. Affirmation in the form of a embossed senator lettering or maybe just how good it would look on my black car. Some kind of compensatory symbol for my lost decades. It's like an affirmation of some kind. Of course, once my electoral journey began, these original reasons began to fade into something more mature, more fitting of public service, of that honor. In fairness, running for office did represent a logical progression for me, student council president, delegate to Iowa Boys State, summer congressional intern, some forgotten student officer position at Brown University. And from my first visit to the legislature on behalf of Hope House, of course, I was smitten, totally smitten. The celestial light streaming down from our story's high capital dome onto the rotunda's marble inlaid floor and its incomprehensible state slogan, how best dressed and how nice everyone was as you really didn't know who anyone really was. But my mission was to secure corrections department funding for the Cadillac of halfway houses, Hope House. To that end, I quickly learned the more rudimentary protocols. Present your card to the attendant and wait patiently behind the clearly marked sign. Be nice to everyone because who knows who they are. When the legislator does emerge, have your elevator speech game tight and never venture onto the, never venture onto the chamber floor while they are in session. But on a deeper level, I immediately felt that I belonged here in this stunningly beautiful building art everywhere in the walls of its many hallways and doing the important work of keeping our tenuous charity solvent. And in maybe a presumptuous way, thinking that I perhaps one day could be on that other side of the aforementioned line. I could learn to speak in a more formal cadence through the chair, of course, sponsor bills, suit up for the game. And reader of the newspaper that I was, I sensed an opportunity in the upcoming presidential election. When no Democratic challenger emerged, I hurriedly moved into the district on the last possible day and filed the necessary paperwork with the local county clerk. My friend gave me a room in the back of her house, and this was my new address. I was surprised, however, to learn that I was not actually registered as a Democrat. Independent, I was, and my soon to be friend at the county clerk's desk looked at me with more than a faint smile. It might help to know what party you are in, Sisto teased. This is all new to me, I answered. 
apparently, he replied. I just didn't vote much back in the 90s, I continued. I wouldn't let your opponent know that, he answered, if I were you. Though, if they take you seriously, they will let that be known. So I did my best to clear what clear it with my Hope House board. It would take the form of a leave of absence, which could maybe help with our program's visibility, as who does not appreciate the struggles of criminal offenders trying to go straight? Well, it worked for me at least, the time off, a, a kind of a break at being spring. And soon I was at the doorsteps, checking for evidence of a dog in the yard, waiting for the door to open, my clipboard in hand and ready with my pitch. And how to convey the beauty of going door to door. How does one convey that? The voter flattered by your visit, once he or she understands that sales or a religious conversion is not in play, just two people talking about how we can make our state a better place to live. Partisan affiliation fading in the bright Saturday afternoon light, closing with the non-committal, just keep me in mind. Request on my end and the usual, I will definitely keep you in mind. Response. One thing became immediately accessible to me, however, and that was the wisdom of going door to door. It was the tradition in my newly claimed home, my newly claimed district. Voters expected as much, especially from a challenger, and I soon realized that this was something that I enjoyed, or mostly enjoyed. It was not difficult to obtain walk lists from the party. Sisto had his limitations, but he can only do what he could do on my behalf and good precinct maps. So off to the streets and gravel roads I went. I had had an initial taste of this process when I obtained the signatures to be the official Democratic nominee in Senate District 10. It seemed fa fairly simple to me, knock on the door of Democratic household, explain who I was, invoke party loyalty, and ask if they would sign my ballot petition. Being new to the neighborhood, to the district, to the process, I did get questions such as, who are you again? And I've never seen you around here before. I then explained that I had grown up in Iowa, but had chosen to live here because New Mexico was such an amazing place and friendly too. And yes, I had moved into this older Hispanic neighborhood and I was clearly not Hispanic, but I had no family in the district, but ultimately it was enough to be a Democrat, my new official party and everyone seemed to have an Irish uncle or cousin, which did not hurt my cause either. In terms of searching for omens, for proof that this was actually a good choice for me as a neophyte candidate canvassing in neighborhoods that were foreign to me, it was my second week when I knocked on Charlie Brophy's door. A silver-haired man with bright blue eyes, clearly Irish, he looked me over thoroughly before responding to my front door pitch. We need to talk, he finally said, and not feeling the agency to decline, I accepted his invitation to join him on his patio for a beer. You're new to this, aren't you? He asked, hand, handing me the beverage in a frosted glass. How did you guess? I replied, not taking offense. It was the way in which you introduced yourself, too tentative, too apologetic, plus I've never heard of you. I've been active in democratic politics here in District 10 for years, for decades. A person has to start somewhere, right? I answered, he had a gentle manner. Who are you again? Chapman Murphy, democratic candidate for Senate District 10. You know that you have the wrong last name for this kind of thing. I've been told that. I remember Sisto's comments to that effect. Don't get me wrong, Charlie continued. We've had some great Anglo representatives in this district over the years. Do you remember Nathan Kelsey? I shook my head. I'm still sort of new to the state. Well, he almost won the governor's race. Should have really. And he started just like you going door to door. He was a state rep for at least a decade. I can't remember how long. That's good to know, I replied. What kind of beer is this anyway? It's really good. St. Polly girl, I keep it on tap. I should serve you Harp or Guinness or something like that, but I prefer the German beers. So why should I support your candidacy? 
Well, well, I'm a Democrat for starters, and you are it, right? Like I don't have any choice. There was no primary. Correct. So you have a pulse, and you are in my party. Why else? I want to make New Mexico a better place. Indeed, that's admirable. Why else? I just think we can do better. We don't have to be 49th in everything, which we seem to be. You are new here, Mr. Brevi teased, clearly. Is that such a bad aspiration? I replied defensively. No, but it's way too general. People want specific reasons to vote for you, especially if you hope to get crossover votes, which you will need in a district like this, which is why you didn't have a primary, by the way. The bluffs? Yes. The bluffs, he sighed. We, but not just up there in the bluffs. This district has changed since Kelsey had it. Damn redistricting, we got screwed. I've been told that. What do you do for a living, he asked. I work with ex-convicts. Oh, great. No, seriously, I replied. Have you heard of Hope House? He shook his head. It's a well-regarded residential program for parolees, men and women, we try to reclaim individuals from the criminal justice system. Okay, he said, that sounds noble. Do you have any specific issue that is propelling this run of yours beyond wanting to make New Mexico a better place? I thought for a moment, I'm still kind of working on my platform. That's fine, he said. Actually, most people won't care what you stand for. They will judge you fairly quickly when they open their door. Doesn't help that you are new here, you are from where? The Midwest? Iowa. Right. Well, we all come from someplace else, except our Native American brothers and sisters, of course. Despite the, the sobering direction of our conversation at this point, the beer was tasting really good in the hot May afternoon, and I felt that Mr. Brophy was trying to help me. Plus, I could tell that he knew what he was talking about. Well, I began. Do you have any questions? Suggestions, I mean. Start raising money. I suppose, supposedly I do that for a living with Hope House. I mean, it should, I should be able to pull that off. How much do you have right now? Not much, I said with honesty. Well, that has to change immediately. Hit up your friends, your family even. You need money to get your message out, which I am still working on. That's fine, you have time, but the money needs to happen now. There are groups for us, like the unions and trial lawyers, that will help. They need to be convinced, though, that you have a chance of winning. The common wisdom is that District 10 is out of reach. People like the incumbent. They respect her. How long has she been there? I'm not sure. You need to know that. You need to research her votes to see if she has had any that could make her vulnerable. Do you have anybody helping you? Not really. Well, that needs to change as well. There are some good campaign managers out there for us, but that costs money too. You will need a good one. Okay, listen, he said, draining his glass. Do you want another beer? No, I answered, feeling slightly buzzed. I need to get back out there on your street. That you can do, and you are smart to start like this. It doesn't cost anything, and people will remember that you visited their house. The incumbent, she doesn't walk the neighborhoods, I told him. She's a Republican, he said. She doesn't have to. Listen, he, re he repeated, I like you. You have a good presence about you. You just need to work. Let me, let me walk you out. I gathered my clipboard and my stapled walk list and followed him out the door. Here is something that should help, he said, shaking my hand one last time with a folded check in his palm. I can help you later too. I, I, and get some signs printed up so that you can put in yards like mine, okay? Okay, I said, truly surprised and flattered. But make sure they are union signs, that they have that union bug on them. It matters to our side, to our people. I turned and faced him, shaking his hand firmly. Thank you so much. You can best thank me by winning. Now go hit those doors. So it took me a couple days to process this visitation from Charlie Brophy. I was increasingly aware of how much work awaited me, and it was daunting not knowing exactly where to begin. But it was affirming to know 
that walking the district was a good thing. And I was definitely in the groove on that front. These lists were good and people were very friendly for the most part. Okay, so that's that's basically the beginning of the book. And I think you have a real sense of it. Um, you know, it's uh, I just uh, enjoyed writing it and reading it. And so I guess, I guess uh, Amanda, we can take questions or response from anyone or anything right. people have on their mind. Sounds good. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about the red license plate? Oh my God. <laughs> I, I, I can't explain it. I just, uh, boy, I used to see my, my mentor Mimi Stewart's red license plate. And man, I just, I just liked it. it. I don't know. I still don't understand it. And of course, you know, these days it's a bit of a risk to be driving around broadcasting that you're a politician and especially in this environment. Um, but I just like my red license plate. But I think, you know, throughout the book, it's obvious that, you know, his, this narrator has deepened his awareness of what he's doing. He's just being honest about, in a humorous way of like, what, what really drove his decision to run for office. And of course, the game is huge. You know, that House Senate basketball game and so forth. So um, he just basically, you know, at the, at the roundhouse, you know, you have advocates, you have lobbyists, and then you have the legislators. So as an advocate, he wanted to be on the other side of that line to be, to be a senator, to be, you know, a legislator. So, you know, certain people are afflicted like that. Some of them are participating in this Zoom right now. So. Right. Tell us how these books came about. How did how did you first decide to build this character into a fictional one that is now appearing in two books? Well, well, thanks. Uh, you know, I basically have always written, always uh, since I got out of college. I, no matter what I was doing for livelihood or what whatever was going on in my life, so um, I inevitably I just write personally and. and uh, I've had to really come to terms with that. It, it is fiction. So much of this is fiction, but I write from personal experience. So there's just a real need to express myself in that way. As you know, I also write poetry. Um, I can say writing no novels are hard. <laughs> you have to keep track of stories and storylines and this and that. But, but I do, um, I, just, I just have that writer instinct and I would say to all the writers out there, you know, it's just a long road. It really is. And my experience has been once you're published, once you're like valid, then the world just kind of opens up. So yeah, I have I have a second book of poetry coming out next month that I'll be doing at your be launch at your bookstore, UNM Press. You know, I just just write personally. I will say this goes back in time. And I do find this interesting. This is 2004. You know, and we've changed a lot politically since that time. And so it's almost like a more innocent time, sadly, in a way to me. And I just, one thing in the book, I just I wanted to really capture what it's like uh, to run for office. And I think in real life, it's an excellent, excellent decision. It's an excellent thing to do, regardless of party or political affiliation. You just, it's a wonderful experience, win or lose. Of course, it's better to win. And, and I win these days. So, <laughs> yay, yes, congratulations. I think the last time we met was pre election, and so now we're post election. Right, yeah, and well, term coming up. Yes, well, I mean, I've been in the legislature in real life 12 years, so but the, again, this book goes back to before I was elected. So, and it's an extension, um, it's the same narrator 10 years later from in my first novel, Panoramic Diaries, which is set in 1994. And so it's the same narrator, you know, 10 years later and so forth. But in both books, uh, the Hope House figures prominently. And, and in real life, that was an intense experience I've had working with men and women coming out of prison in New Mexico, trying to help them get on the straight and narrow, so to speak. Mm -hmm. 